Welcome in to Other People's Shoes. As you know, I am your host, Neil Matthews. Thank you so much for joining me today. Super excited about our guest today. We just get to travel down the I-5 corridor. We find ourselves in Napa Valley area. So grab a Merlot, maybe pair it with something amazing. Help me welcome in our guest today, if you will. Our guest has a career that has been spent in the entrepreneurial space on with online marketing. In fact, he spent the last five years for a Fortune 500 company with securities. He's worked for all kinds of spectrum business wise. In fact, he's been happily married to his girlfriend of 31 years. Together, they have raised three children into adulthood. Empty nesters they are now, right? He has accomplished a great many of things in relationships and development with family and friends and colleagues and co-workers. In fact, some would even say he is a trusted husband, father, friend, and colleague. His goal today, I love it when a guest has a goal, by the way. So hopefully we can accomplish this goal for him. His goal today, Today is to provide you with three questions and a model to create more meaning and happiness in your life with your friends, with your family, with your work, and impact those around you. This is not therapy or a belief system, but a tool to help you emphasize and get clarity in the most important ways. Help me welcome him in, Chris Templeton. Chris, how are you today? I am doing well. Thank you so much for having me, Neil. I totally appreciate it. You know, this is one of those moments that I really love as a podcast right? Five minutes before showtime, five minutes before episode, we do this kind of weird icebreaker, kind of just get to know you. And then we're like, bam, bing, boom. Here we go. We're recording and we're off and running, right? It's the way I like to do it. It's the way I like to do it. Too much prep never seems to help, does it? You know, and I was wondering about that too, because I've prepped for some like big time people and and then I get on air and I hit that record button and I'm like, all of the prep just goes away. And I'm like, why did I spend so much time getting ready for said person? and I didn't use any of it. And I'm like mad at myself. I'm like, that was time so much wasted. Anyway. You know, I I used to do a radio show for the local chamber and I would prep for... Oh God, an hour or two and notes and calls, talk to the, and I said to, to the general manager one day, I said, Jeff, you know, what do you do for, you, you do such a great job of interviewing. And he goes, I just have the first question. And then I just listen. It's like, Oh, and out the door, all that prep went for me. And I was so grateful. You know, I've been accused of that myself is like somebody, so many times younger podcasters will come ask me to be on their show or ask for advice or whatever. I feel like I'm a veteran now. I've made it through the pod fade. I've made it through all that. We're three years in now we're we're kind of as a as a toddler we're getting ready to, to eat solid foods and maybe get potty trained as a podcast <laughs> i don't know <laughs> terrible analogy perhaps for me you know people do ask and i and i say here's where i do and, and i'm like you i have that one question that i lead with and then from there it's just curiosity it's just listening and, and, and i think that to me makes the great conversations really synergy takes place absolutely there's there's no question i mean yeah i i, I was saying to somebody earlier today that i i had a client that i do do this for a living. I do interviews for a living. And and I had a client who she had done a podcast for her client and then hired me in. And I listened to her podcast and you could just hear how each question was just, you know, okay, you answered. Now I get to ask my next question. It was like, oh girl, you just lost all of the, the, the value there. So yes, I'm a big, big, big fan of first question, listen, uh, what do they call it? Actively listen. agree. So with that, Chris, it's only fitting that we ask you this amazing question. Now you talk about interviewing people, you talk about coaching people, you talk about being paid to interview people. Dream come true of mine. If I could somehow get the ruby or the glass slippers and and make all my dreams come true, like Cinderella, that would be my dream job. So if you know anyone that's hiring, just kidding, but you can let me know that maybe afterwards. We're both. All right. Fair enough. We both want to make a living behind the mic. Absolutely. One day, one day. But for me, uh, Chris, if we were going to ask you this question, what size shoes do you where what would be the answer to that said question 12 and a half sometimes a 13 <laughs> okay as i said to my son who wears the same size dude 
That big toe keeps you vertical. <laughs> Be thankful because we're both tall. I think he's 6'2 and I'm 6'4". Wow. All right. There we go. And then as far as a style or brand of shoe that you like maybe more than another? Really like slides. Something I, like a leather slide that I just, I hate tie shoes. Prefer no shoes at all. Is that a, a, an answer? I, I'm in thongs all day long. Occasionally, if I have to go out, I'll, I'll put real shoes on. No shoe judgment. Well, I mean, there's a little bit of shoe judgment here. Because I, can I am. It. Uh, I'm one of those guys that shamefully admitting I have upwards of 50 pairs of shoes. And so, yeah, wow. I have a few and I've even retired some that's that have made it to the wall that I don't even wear. I just, I just look at, and when I come into the studio, I'm like, Oh, those are so pretty. And I touch them and hold them. I'm like, can't wear them anymore though. Cause they're too important. Is that weird as a guy? I don't know. That's a good place for clothing to be. I don't think so. I mean, it's, it may be unusual, but I'm not going with weird. We all have that kind of stuff, don't we? Well, we all have that one thing. So Chris, getting into you and your story and kind of what resonated with you, I think most about this season, this proverbial shadow. Now, when I started thinking about this and really brainstorming, really, you know, kind of hitting the the kind of quiet time, getting still, that's where my creativity comes from is, is for me being still, which is so hard sometimes for me as, as a creator. I kept thinking about this shadow, this presence, this overwhelming feeling. Now, that can be interpreted in so many different ways, as you might imagine. For you, what would be that shadow or that kind of presence that was maybe around you or has been around you in your past, present, or maybe even now? I think there's a couple of them. One of them is, I think, the shadow that everybody kind of feels at some point in their day, in their week, in their life. Think of it as kind of like, you know, the dark cloud that, that everybody envisions. And I've always had some element of that, mostly around trying to understand, I think, why people behave the way they do and why I behave the way I do. So I've always had that. One of the things that's come clear to me is that everybody has it. Like there's nobody that doesn't have a shadow over them at, at some point. And then it really becomes just a question of how much, doesn't it? A shadow that I have turned into something that's 24-7, or is it just an occasional shadow? So I've, I've always had some level of, of that, and I think everybody does. I think it's a universal. No, I know it's a universal. There's nobody on the face of the planet that has been or you know will be that won't have some shadow. And I also think one of the things that's really important to consider in regards to that, Neil, is that shadows are important. Shadows are, are where meaning comes from in our lives when we kind of figure out that they're there and that there's value in them. The, the other shadow for me has always been money. I've always just really struggled with money. It's never been, I, and I can I can articulate it exactly why. I had a dad who always said, you know, you guys are, are always milking me, and we weren't. But boy, oh boy, did we get a message. And then a mom who's like, oh, don't worry about it. Everything's going to be fine. We'll take care of it. That was always an issue for me. So those are kind of the, the two aspects of shadows that I see from from my humble vantage point in the wine country. <laughs> I love that on, on a lot of levels. One, I love it because I do agree with you on some level that I think people have had this overwhelming presence, shadow, whatever you want to say, self-doubt, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. But again, I, I think when I was envisioning this, like everybody's been kind of, I, I'm sharing with you in the green room that we, we got some negative feedback finally, which to me says something that, hey, somebody's listening, right? Or somebody's, you know, keying in. For me, when I think about the shadow, when I think about things that have been in my life, I really think about it being very oppressive, very just almost holding me down and, and almost just to the point where I'm almost paralyzed in some respects. So when you talk about that dark cloud, when you talk about, you know, kind of your dad growing up and money being an issue as well, kind of, you know, these, these elements coming into your life, why was your dad and why was money for you feeling like that maybe oppressive thing that was coming over you? Uh, well, I don't know for my dad. I, th I think it was something that he grew up with. You know, one of the things that always hits me is we, we have a tendency to judge somebody's behavior and not look at the origin of that behavior. And I know his dad was a pretty much a jerk about money and that sort of thing. And so I think for my dad, that kind of played into it. He was very, very narcissistic. Everything was about him. And if you were in, he was going to have a really, you were going to have a good time with him. And if you were out, you were out. I don't know. I, I think that it's just the therapist that I see calls it origin stories. And I think that these origin stories really have a huge impact. Some that are easy to let go 
go with. And there are others that just aren't. Like my dad screwed around all the time. I, I think I was 15 when I found out that he was doing that. And I was devastated. And I've been with my girlfriend of 31 years and wife of 27 years, never had a single desire to do that, which isn't to say I don't appreciate beautiful women and that sort of thing. You know, so that was an easy one to overcome. Parenting was something way better, way, way easier for me to do than I think it was for my dad. Money was just an issue for him. One of the things that I heard the other day from my therapist, she was his therapist as well, the myth of him and who he was and how much money he had. And, and it turned out, I remember being 21 and he said, you know, oh man, I, I live from paycheck to paycheck, but we were very well off. I think it's all that crazy stuff. And some of it's so crazy that I think it gets embedded deeper and it's hard for us to kind of undo those things. So what would you say the number one thing that you really feel like has, has been deeply embedded in you that maybe you haven't been able to really get rid of? Been working on really getting to a place where like I have an outstanding marriage. I'm a good dad. My kids love me. 22 to 36. I have a incredibly rich group of friends, but that's the one thing that's always just been a struggle for me. I Sometimes I think the harder we fight it, one of the things you said earlier is, is that, that oppressive feeling about it. I think when we fight it, strengthens it. How do I get to the same place that I am in my relationships, that kind of energy level and having the same level of energy that I have around money? And so that's been the toughest thing. And, and, uh, and you know, bottom line is uh, I've never been out on the street and I, you know, we've always been able to put food on the table and the kids are well clothed and, and happy. So, you know, it's all a measure. It's all a question of, you know, what your perspective. And the other thing that I think is really important, like we talked about a little earlier, you know, when you have shadows, they're also the foundation of some really good stuff if you get, if you can get to that place. And so, you know, as much as it's not my favorite place to be, like I'd love to, you know, be making three times more than I make. And I'd be really happy with that. You know, it has provided some really fabulous foundations for me, my family, my friends, and that sort of thing. So it's not all bad. If I'm being real, right? It, I mean, that's the whole idea sometimes behind shows like like mine is we want real, we want that real conversation. We yep. want that authenticity comes to mind too. But in that, I mean, if you had all the money in the world, well, maybe not all the money in the world, but I mean, if I you're bringing in, you know, <laughs> let's throw out a number. I mean, if you're bringing in 10 million a month, I mean, is that... Is that going to wreck you or is that going to satisfy you? Or are you going to want to want 15 million? I think that's one of the things that's interesting in terms of going back to this kind of origin story with my dad. I don't think my dad enough was ever enough. And I don't have any desire to make $10 million a year. I mean, if I made a quarter of a million dollars, I'd be thrilled a year. I mean, that's I, I just don't need that much. And part of being at my age has brought a, a tremendous amount of clarity about what's important to me. So I'm not saddled in any way way by this need for more, more, more. More have been a question of uh, why can't I get enough versus, oh, give me all the money in the world. But growing up, you know, I, my dad was a Marine, is a Marine. I always say was, and people are like, oh, he's he's past. I'm so sorry. I'm like, sorry. He <laughs> is still, in his mind, still a Marine. Once a Marine, always a Marine, right? Yep. For me, growing up, he was never there. And when he was there, emotionally, he was like checked out, which was sad in a lot of respects. For me, there were certain things that I did learn from him. I learned a sense of duty. I learned a sense of responsibility. I learned, I learned how sometimes not to handle marriage. I learned how not to handle relationships. I learned how not to talk to people because the way he would talk yep. to us sometimes was like, mm, yeah, I don't want to ever talk to my kids that way. And I found myself a time or two doing it. Ugh. My wife's sure, like, you sound like course. your dad right now. I'm like, thank you, honey. I love you. But no. But so when I hear that conversation centering around your dad, were there certain things, traits, mannerisms, whatever that you were very mindful of not to make sure that that did carry on with your kids? And if so, what were those? The thing that was interesting about the places where I thrive is it didn't take a lot of work. Like, yeah, I mean, my wife and I both had dads that were, you know, liked a lot of money and were kind of gruff. I don't think I ever thought, okay, I'm going to be really nice to my kids. Like, that's not it. Somehow I realized, like you said, gee, that was, that's the way I don't want to behave. Kind of the interesting thing, right? I mean, I think we all have places, go back to this idea of the dark cloud or the shadows. We all have places where we don't have that, where we don't have that cloud. And for me, it just wasn't there in my relationship with my wife, my kids, my friends. 
happened. It just wasn't. I, I, I remember at some point, probably 20, 25 years ago, realizing that I didn't need to spend time with people that I didn't know, enjoy being with. And that was a really nice thing. But it, it, it's, those things have never been a struggle for me. It's been more of a clarity thing from dad or, and mom. I don't want to be able, I don't want to do that. I, I This is how I would prefer to operate. If I can, I know we just met, so maybe I'm not allowed to push him enough. I don't know. No, go for it. But in that, I, I still think there is this underlining, like there must have been something that you saw that you still were like, you know what? Because from what you're describing, again, I'm only basing it on what you're describing. You're describing this guy who, no disrespect to your dad, but from the sound of it was kind of like a womanizer, right or wrong? Yes, yes. And and maybe struggled with some lust and some, you know, other things of that nature that kind of derails a lot of relationships, some? especially between male, <laughs> all. So I was trying to be nice. I, I don't know the I'm, guy. I'm I don't want to, you know, <laughs> don't want to throw rocks at a guy I don't know. But in that, I hear you say like, hey, I saw the way he treated women. I saw the way he stepped out on my mom. Mm-hmm. I think on some level, again, I'm not your psychologist. I don't have a degree. But I think on some level that hurt you. I think that scarred you in some oh, respects. Oh, there's no because, question about it. Because now you're the complete opposite. You have this solid relationship with your wife. You have a solid relationship with your kids from the sound of it. And so I'm like, how does this not have some variance on on who Chris is now? I guess is what I'm asking. I mean, really, somehow I was able to do, whether it was therapy, the relationship I have with my wife, I was able to take those shadows and turn them into something that was authentic and good about me and how I approached the world. Was there pain? Oh my God, absolutely. When I found out my dad was screwing around, we were on a boat up a river for a long vacation and I had to sit, be on the same boat and, and figure that out with my dad and my mom sitting right there. And of course, I would, wasn't about to say a word about it. So yeah, there's a lot of pain in there. But I also think that, you know, when you take that, those shadows and those painful things and kind of do take the time to figure out, gee, what do I want? And then also recognize that every now and then you're going to have the same behavior, you know, whether it's how you treat somebody or thankfully not screwing around, but there's a way to take that pain and turn turn it into something that's productive and that's authentic. That's what I'm all about in terms of why I'm on the air with you is about helping people to understand that those things are there, that they are they don't have to be the end of the world and that they can be a jumping off point for something way, way better. So what do you think your jumping off point with your dad was? For a long time after my parents split up, um, I was really angry with my dad. We still, we sailed a lot together. At some point, I just realized that I could take the good and be good with it, take the bad and be honest about it, but not feel like it needed to overwhelm my behavior. And I just got to a point where I was like, oh, I can be me without any concern about who he is, what he thinks of me. And I mean, he liked me. It wasn't like he didn't like me. And those origin stories really were while I was still, you know, in school and that sort of thing. Probably in my early 30s, recognizing, hey, you know what? Um, I can be my own person and I don't need to have my dad be a part of that equation anymore. Any kind of, certainly a negative part of the equation. There's this groundhog out in Pennsylvania. Maybe you've heard of him, Poxitani Phil. Yep, yep. So I, I I was trying to make sure I got this right, but if he sees his shadow, we have six more weeks of winter. Right. Is that right? Did I get I that right? I think so. Okay. I think that's right. I think I Googled that right. So if he doesn't, then it's like six more weeks till spring. We don't want him to see his shadow, I guess is what I'm saying. So yes. we, we, we don't want him to have a shadow. So if for some reason we could somehow take away the pain of your of your dad and the pain of that because I think there is some pain there maybe I'm sure. projecting if somehow we could take that away do you think that would change the way you behaved the way you operated now somehow absolutely but I wouldn't want it I would not want to I don't want to take that away because it's been the the foundation of so much good stuff in my life. Like, I mean, I'm convinced that I wouldn't be the dad or the partner I am or the friend that I am without witnessing my dad's behavior. So no, I don't want to change any of that. It's not to say that I back on it fondly, but I also am able to tell a story that's really authentic about him. Like I can talk about the good stuff and the bad stuff and it's, I'm in a place with it that it doesn't to be a negative thing anymore. And I think that's the key really to life is recognizing that, hey, this doesn't have to be, like we were talking about at the onset, right? This doesn't have to be that overwhelming presence that's paralyzing me, that's pushing me down, that's, you know, oppressing me, that's kind of keeping me in bondage and chains, that that shadow can go away and spring can really truly come. A new, fresh kind of perspective, which is awesome. And that that perspective can serve you for as, as long as you want. It's one of the things that's really important to me. In this project of mine, I talk about little me thinking. And little me thinking is 
is is fear based. It makes us feel like a victim of the past or the future and that sort of thing. When we're having authentic thinking, that we're able to look at the whole spectrum openly, look at it straight in the face, like that, didn't like that, no, did not like that. That was really cool. When you've got that perspective, I think that you just end up in this so much better place and you're so much richer for the tough experiences. Like that that stuff is character building once you've figured out what the story is that you're going to tell about it in a way that serves you and that's authentic. I don't want to change any of that. No, God, no. I, I'm grateful for all of it. I don't want it. wouldn't wish it on anybody, some of that stuff, but that doesn't mean that it hasn't served me in a huge way. Huge. So on that same kind of thread, is there a scar or is there a mark that has been left on your life that you're really still like, when you look back on it, you go, oh yeah, that's when that happened. Okay. Wow. That really changed me. Is there a moment like that for you? Probably when I found out that he was screwing around. Another time was when I found out that he was living paycheck to paycheck because we were not poor by any stretch of the imagination. So more around things like, oh my God, how did I not know that? That is my mom finding out that he was screwing around on her. You know, how did I not know that? And I think at some level we all knew it through college that, uh, but we were pretty much the ideal family. And, and in a lot of ways, we were. So I think there's a, a variety of little places like that. Nothing that that um, nothing that I wish hadn't happened. So you mentioned your project. What's going on with that? How can folks get involved and, and maybe hear more about that? The reason that I contacted you about being on your podcast and was so thrilled about the Shadows piece is I've spent since 2003 pretty significant amount of time developing what I call Oh, the Stories We Tell. And anybody can go look at it at Oh, the Stories We Tell tell.com. Basically what that is, is it started out as three questions. And if, if listeners were to, to take a piece of paper, make it landscape so it's, it's wider than tall. And on the left, down the left, top left, the first question is, what's the story I'm telling? Middle left is, does this story serve me in this moment? And then on the third question, the bottom left is, is there a more authentic story I can tell? And so those are the three questions. What's the story I'm telling? And that's about my thinking, what I'm thinking about myself, about anything that's going on around me. What's the story? And we say story simply because what I'm trying to do is to break anything that seems like fact, like, oh, well, that's my thinking, period. Well, that's... (laughs) Because that ain't that ain't right. And so when we call your thinking story and story can be thinking, it can be pictures, words. But when we call that story, it's automatically assumes that it can be edited and that it can be changed and modified. And so that's the first question. The second question is, is this story serving me in this moment, in this moment, in this moment, in this moment? So, so, so important. It's it's like you said, you asked, you know, there are things that have impacted you in the past and, and you know, how does that impact you now? Here's the, the key to why I'm so grateful that for the tough stuff that I dealt with growing up with my dad, because in the moment, no matter how I responded back then, those ways of responding, being angry with my dad, that sort of thing, simply didn't serve me here and now. All it did is it just meant I was carrying that crap around and I didn't need it. When I look at a story and say, is it serving me in this moment? I'm really looking at it and saying, gee, do I feel like, does this feel okay to me or not? That's the middle question. And we draw a line across the page, horizontal line. And basically in my model, anything Anything where you where the answer is no goes above the line. Thinking that is fear based, I feel like a victim. I feel helpless. That's all thinking above the line, and I call that little me thinking. Then below the line, if the, your thinking is serving you in this moment, that's called authentic me. And it's thinking that is open. It's allowing. You're curious. The opposite of fear. Did you know the opposite of fear is curiosity? Never would have guessed that. I did not know that, actually. That's that's news to me right now. But when you think about it, think, think about it. If you're fearful of something, you're like, all I want to do is make that go away. When you're the opposite of that, you're like, hmm, I wonder what that's about. And that's where you start to say, gee, you know, 
dad was a jerk in a lot of ways, but he was also pretty amazing in a lot of other ways. And so that's that authentic thinking that goes below this line does serve me. And now I get the richness of reinterpreting the stories that I had as a kid to stories as an adult, like, oh my God, I never want to screw around, but I'm so glad that I had that fixed in my mind because that just helped me for some reason not to ever want to do that. You know, here I am 31 years later with this woman that uh, head over heels in love with. Question is, if what I've got is, and it's not serving me, can I tell a more authentic story? And think about how that frees us up. Like, we're so used to being in this place where we're like, and then that son of a bitch screwed around and I didn't want anything to do with him ever. And what do we end up with? Anger, victimization, fear that we'll do the same thing over again. Instead, convert that into a story that serves us. Oh my God, the world opens up in so many ways. But I feel like so many times people come on and they want to talk about the us. And they want to talk about the we's and they want to talk about the world. And it's like, no, no, I want to know you. I want to know your story. I want to know what makes you who you are. Why is there power in that for you in your mind? First of all, in regards to where so many of your guests are and how so many people are in the world, little me thinking can be really positive, Neil. Like, hey, Neil, let's talk about kumbaya and let's make the world a better place. And all of those things are okay. But if what we're doing is we're using those things as the conditions for our happiness, which is very much little me land, like, well, if everybody would just behave the way that I want them to, and if they would all talk in this voice and we just all got along, it's not real. It's not authentic thinking. It feels like it. We all want things to be better. But the problem is, is that so many people get stuck in what they think it should be. And they get stuck in looking and finding, trying to find their happiness chasing emotions by doing the right thing and expecting that somebody's going to do the right thing and, and everything's going to go bad and blah 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 and I'm like man I want you to be in a place where it doesn't matter what anybody else does and you do what's important to you what's authentic to you and when you're below that line in authentic me thinking oh my god it's a whole different world it is a whole different it's I, I, I equate this model to putting on a pair of clear corrective glasses on life. Like it's not about Rosie. Absolutely frustrates the hell out of me is all this focus on positive thing. Oh, you know, Neil, what you need to do is you just need to be positive. One of the things we haven't talked about, but above the line, when you move above the line, you go from kind of being this narrator to being uh, having a little protector going off. And he's always working to make sure that you're safe and that you're, you know, you're not going to be harmed and that sort of thing. It's how we are wired. I call them the protector. Most people call that the ego. Part of negative thinking above the line is that the ego is the enemy. And the, and the minute that you let go of that, oh my God, life gets so much better. When you recognize there's this aspect of you that is really trying its best to protect you and listen to that and then address it from an authentic place, like bringing that thinking down below the line, literally talking that little guy down, dude, dude relax. I got this. I hear what you're saying. Like giving it the due that it, it's worth, that it deserves for trying to protect you. Then you then have this ability to have an authentic story about what's going on. So many people are stuck in, and in terms of the shadow, <laughs> welcome to the protector. The protector is there to, to cast that shadow, that net far and wide so that you're safe. But what we end up doing is really driving ourselves insane in a lot, a lot of different ways ways. So, you know, being able to get down below that line puts me in a place where I'm way more open to what's going on. I'm more curious about getting the facts as, as opposed to when I'm up in little me land. I'm like, well, I'm going to prove to you why I'm right and you're wrong. Oh, yippee. Here we go. You see that in politics all the time now. Well, I just pulled up a picture of your diagram that you're describing that you sent us. And, and to me, being a visual person, it really helps visualization of what you're describing. And to me, I think, again, I can put myself in these elements, right? I know there have been things in my life that have been the protector of me. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a habit. Maybe it's a hurt. Maybe it's a the proverbial coat. Yep. I was even thinking of Christopher Robin, as weird as this sounds, like with Winnie the Pooh, right? He has the rain, the, the umbrella. Oh, it looks like rain. Here comes the rain, you know? <laughs> the shadow 
shadow is coming, right? The protection of that. And I think so many times for me, and maybe you you can speak to this, of course, I'd love to get your insight on this, is if you allowed the protector to be the major voice in your life and nothing else, what would your life have turned out to be? Oh, it'd be miserable. Oh my God, I would be miserable. How, how and, so and- though? I mean, because it's easy to, uh, forgive me for saying, but it's easy to say like, oh, it'd have been bad. Well, well, how would be, it have been Because bad? I would have been angry at my dad all my life. I also would have been pretty pissed off at my mom for some of the ways that she, you know, worked to handle my dad. She was a, a real enabler. And, you know, I love her dearly. But she did not, as much as she was trying to help. So I would have carried that. I would have not been a good dad. I would have been angrier and more frustrated. I had, I had a great experience. My boy graduated from high school about six years ago. And one of the things that he had to do was do a project, a senior project. And so he decided what he was going to do was build a little shed to put tools in because we had a smaller shed. You know, you put the tool in and it's that tin roof and, you know, you hit the roof. And boom, it just sounds like an explosion. It's like, that's what I'm going to do. So we ended up, he came to me one day and he said, he said, hey, dad, um, how would you feel if I didn't walk the stage? <laughs> and I said, dude, you're doing your senior project and I'm happy to help you. Well, we started working on it. And one day we're doing something and he's a little cranky and I am getting crankier and crankier by the moment. And he feels it, the energy's crap. And all of a sudden I was like, I'm being, I'm doing exactly what my dad used to do with me. And then being able to say to him, hey dude, you know what? I just want you to know right here and now, I know exactly why I'm having such a hard time. And I took the time to explain it to him, which my dad never would have done. You know, you stop at emotion. So there's so many ways, like I just being open, being a better listener, open to politically, being able to easily tell both sides of the story, regardless of which side you're on. I can tell you the opposite side and with clarity and without anger, judgment. Oh, no judge, almost no judgment judgment. I, I mean, I'm, I won't say that there's no judgment, but the amount of judgment that I would have had without this would be almost debilitating. And I think about how many people are in this same situation where they just don't understand that they're in little me mode and they're accepting emotion as fact and they stop. And I'm saying, dude, check this out. Does it, is that serving you in this moment? Oh my God, no. What should I do? Tell a more authentic story. So, you know, there are loads of ways that, that my life would be crap happier. Um, but thankfully they're not. I have a friend, his biggest thing is being authentic. If I had a dollar for every time I heard my buddy John say authentic, I, I probably would be able to quit my job because he just says it all the time. Like it's his favorite word, I think. When he says that, does it resonate with you or do you feel like it's the reason I have such a hard time with positive thinking is there are a lot of people that are walking around saying, you know, you just need to be authentic. But the minute that things don't go right for them, jump to cranky land. And so if he really like lives lives it and he means it and you feel better by it. You know, that's one of the things that's also so cool when you're truly authentic. The influence that you have over people is is mind boggling. Like one of the things I've always been good is being authentic with people interpersonally. You know, if you can do that, great. And and if he's that way, all the power to him. True authenticity is a lovely and wonderful thing. Well, being a sports guy, I know there is the certified authenticity talking about that. Like they've, it's been certified, like this is real. This is legit. This has not been forged document or anything like that. No Mark Carmen here. I think he was the guy that forged the Utah documents. If people are wanting to know more about your diagram, the authenticness, how can people reach out to you and, and hear more about what you're doing, Chris? And, and tell us about that. A few ways. First one is my website, Oh, the stories we tell dot com um, that has the primary diagram that we've been talking about in a little more detail than we can go into on the air. So that's the first place. The second place is when you go to my website, you'll see my logo, which is a thought bubble that says, oh, the stories we tell in it. And if you search for oh, the stories we tell on YouTube, I don't have it branded yet. And please like my YouTube channel so I can brand it with with oh, the stories we tell in the, the URL. But if you search for oh, the stories we tell on YouTube, one of the first results that will come up is this 
little thought bubble. And that's my YouTube channel. On there are about 20-ish videos. One of the things I love about what I do is I, when I tell people about this, it sticks with them. And there's a woman I told this about this model about seven or eight years ago that I used to work with. And she got a hold of me in February, right before the pandemic. And she said, you know, we should do, we should do something with this. Let's do recordings. She had a rough upbringing. She said, why don't, you know, we just walk some of my issues through this model. And so on the YouTube channel, there's a playlist called The Honesty Project. And uh, what we did is we had, we've got about 20 recordings, I think 14 are up right now. And we just talk about, I, the first four were just conversation about difficult employees. How do I deal with difficult coworkers? And then what we did a little later on is we just did an intro to the model and how it works. So the first, I think four or five are all about how the model works and, and why it's important and how it can help. Anyway, that's the second way. Facebook is another play uh, forward slash other stories we tell, Instagram, other stories stories we tell. Um, I'm on Twitter, but I don't do much there. So those are the, the best ways to get a hold of me and to see what I'm doing. And if you want to do a consultation about this, I'm charged for those, but I'm more than willing to sit down with anybody and talk through an issue that they're having. And, and this is not therapy. I'm not a therapist. This is, I'll simply help them apply what they're thinking to this model. And that's the beauty of this. Like this thing is about a tool that you can walk away with. It's not a belief system. It'll fit with your religion, with your politics, uh, it doesn't matter. Your work situation, your marriage, your kids, it applies to all of that equally. And so it's it's a tool that you can take away that you go, oh my God, I'm putting on the glasses and seeing this more clearly. So those are the primary ways to get a hold of me. That's fantastic, Chris. Thanks so much for that. I appreciate that. And of course, we will link all of that in our illustrious show notes. So please, of course, go take a look at that and we will have Chris's information there. So Chris, again, as we wrap up today, I never we never really even got to, but I'm just guessing you are not a major sports fan. You just don't strike me as a sports ball <laughs> kind of fella. Well, it's funny that you should mention that. I'm very tall and everybody thought that I should play basketball, but uh, I didn't start watching. I, I had a really crappy, <laughs> there's one, I had a really crappy baseball experience as a kid where the coach came over and said, do you mind if we don't play your son? <laughs> and so I was never a big sports fan until about nine or 10. And we finally got TV. We hadn't been with it for a number of years because we chose not to have it. And my wife loves basketball and baseball. So being in the Bay Area, you know, we watched the Giants and they had a really great announcers. And I totally got into that and then into the Warriors for basketball. And I've always loved football, but no, I'm not a big, not a huge guy. Can't go through the facts and all that. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. But if you were to play college basketball, is there any colleges that maybe you would choose from if you could pick any in the world? maybe well, or the united see, states it wasn't all bad with my dad and my dad was the leading free throw three throw. what do they call that free throw i think you're saying yeah free th free throws it's a tough word it's he very led tough his school in free throws at wofford w-o-f-f-o-r-d oh, wofford yeah and he threw like he did free throws like rick berry you know how that was yeah underhand the granny That's style right. yeah in fact rick berry's grandson I think he played at Florida. He uh, ended up playing in the NBA for the Rockets, I think. I don't know. I'm testing my memory. I should probably Google. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, he was shooting like the granny shot free throws in the NBA recently. Rick Barry's grandson. I'll be. So it would have to be in honor of my dad because it wasn't all bad. Um, and even the bad ended up turning out pretty good for me. Uh, it would have to be Wofford College. Which I believe those are the Terriers. I think that is actually right. I know it's a it's a dog. I think it, it's a dog. I think, I think it's it a, terrier. a Terrier. You could Google me and fact check me if you want, but I, <laughs> I think I'm good on that. So anyway, as I said, we play this game called Senseless. It is five questions because I think there's five senses and then sixth is the wild card. So since you're not here in Oregon and you're still in Napa drinking your wine, Wine, looking at the vineyards, which is funny because we both don't drink wine. And anyway, it's just funny. It All right, funny. so I'm going to roll for you, see if I can help with that. All right, number four, there's the proof. Number four right there. So number four is this, is what sound or noise does Chris love to hear? I love the sound of a muscle car motor. I love that. Oh, and you know what I love more than that? I love the sound of a jet fighter. Just love that sound. Wow, so if you had to choose one or the other, which one Jet would you fighter, pick? hands down. F-16, okay. plane of choice. 
Is that the uh, Tomcat? Is that F-16 No, that's Tomcat? the F-14. That's the one with oh, the, right. the two engines. Oh, the engines Hornet, F-16. The, uh, the Hornet is the F-18. The Falcon is the F-16. It's the single engine that's been around since the 80s, and they, they call it the, the last sports model. <laughs> Just messing up my planes right now. I thought I was good. <laughs> I'm not an Air Force guy, clearly. I am not a naval aviator, even though I did dream of being goose when I was in high school. But I am not a naval aviator. That's a whole nother story for a whole nother conversation of my Top Gun fandom. I play one on, on the computer every now and then. But uh, but Chris, I just want to say, man, thank you so much for coming on. It's really been a pleasure today. It's been my pleasure, too. Thank you, Neil. Totally appreciate the opportunity. So guys and gals alike, we are off and running. Do not let that shadow continue to oppress you, to paralyze you. In fact, today, I think we got some great insight from Chris. Chris, talking about how important it is to really recognize what has been protecting you. Has it been that shadow? Have you allowed that shadow to speak into your life? And if you have, why? I know that sounds weird to talk about a shadow in that fashion, but I think some of you who have struggled with it know that. So are you going to continue to allow that shadow to be the six months of winter that you've been in? Or are you going to finally allow that shadow to kind of dissipate and really get to the more authentic you? And if you are, let me know. Let me know if you do that. Let me know if you take Chris's advice. I would love to hear that. You, of course, can reach out to us at OPS Podcast Show under the voicemail tab, or you can even do it under the connections tab. Or if you're one of those social media people, hey, you can do that too over at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We have the handle OPS Podcast Show. Love, of course, to connect with you there. And just remember this. Do not ever forget. Remember, when you walk in other people's shoes, you really do get a different perspective on life. I'm your host, Neil Matthews. Thank you so much for joining us and stay tuned till next week when we walk in other people's shoes.